and welcome to Mount Tabor. My name is Gray Handwork. I'm the coordinator of guest and new member ministries, and my family and I have been attending Mount Tabor for over six years because we believe in Mount Tabor's mission to gather joyfully, to grow spiritually, and to go faithfully into the world to make disciples of Christ. If this is your first time with us today, or if you're new to Mount Tabor, we are so glad you're here, and we consider your presence to be a gift to us. We'd like to pay that gift forward by making a donation in your honor to the Mask the City Project. Would you please let us know you're here by getting out your phone and texting the word HELLO to the number 336-777-7990. You'll see that number and information on your screen. We look forward to opening up a line of communication with you and getting to know one another. We're glad that you're here and we want you to be part of our mission to gather, grow, and go. Now, whether you've been at Mount Tabor for a minute or for a lifetime, we want to connect with you, especially during this time. We hope you'll stop by our website. This is a congregation that believes in the power of prayer, and we would love to pray with you and for you. So check out our prayer request button where you can leave us your prayer requests. You can also find on our website our bulletin, our events calendar, and lots of information about things that continue to happen uh, here at Mount Tabor during this time. We'd love for you to get connected with our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our adult small groups, lots of things that are still happening. You can also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We look forward to connecting with you and staying connected during this time. So now let's turn our eyes and our hearts to the one who has called us together today. Let's worship together. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching us. I hope you're doing well. I hope things are going well in your life and you're continuing to adapt and be flexible in this crazy world that we're living in. Uh, and thank you so much for staying connected. That's important. Uh, we continue our worship series today on a mountaintop experience based on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And our message today is going public, a lesson in money and ambition. Let's worship together. join in our call to worship. Praise the Lord. We come to sing praises to God. Praise the Lord. We come to give thanks for all God has done in our lives. Praise the Lord. We come to worship our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Let us now join in our first hymn of the morning together. Hymn number 67, We Thy People Praise Thee. Oh, 
Affirmation of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. As we enter into our time of prayer, let's first spend a few moments in silence, after which I'll offer a reading for today, and then we'll conclude with a recitation of the Lord's Prayer. Let's go to God together. Gracious God, you made the earth on which we stand, the air of which we breathe, and the beauty in the sky we stand beneath. How vast is your creativity, how immeasurable is the delicate balance and detail in creation. And yet you chase after us like a shepherd watches sheep. You know us by name and pour out grace through your redeeming love. Father, you long for us to recognize your imprint on all we see, to take hold of freedom from the prison of our humanity, and to be redeemed to walk again with you. Lord, let us now play our part in kingdom life. May we take your light into the darkness. May we give testimony to your redeeming work in our lives and love beyond the fringes of our own small lives. Living by the Spirit, may you work through us to reach a hurting world. We pray all of this and more in the mighty name of the one who taught his disciples then and his disciples now to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We come to the time when we bring our gifts before the Lord, assured that they do make a difference. May we pray. Father God, we give with joy into your kingdom today. May you bless our offering. Come, O Lord, and work through these gifts. Extend your love through us, we pray. Amen. And now join us in singing the hymn for the fruits of this creation. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. Fill our minds with your peace and our hearts with your love. Today our scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, Matthew verses 19 through 34. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, 
your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can you, any of you, by worrying at a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Michael Thomas tells the personal story in the classic book, the New York Times bestseller, Chicken Soup for the Soul, uh, about driving to a business appointment. He said, as usual, I was planning in my mind what I was going to say. I came to this very busy intersection where the stoplight had just turned red. And I thought to myself, I could probably beat that next light if I get out ahead of the pack. My mind and car were in autopilot, ready to go when suddenly an unforgettable sight broke my trance. A young couple, both blind was walking arm in arm across this busy intersection with cars whizzing by in every direction. The man was holding the hand of a little boy. The woman was clutching a baby to her chest. Each of them had a white cane extended, searching for clues to navigate them across the intersection. Initially, I was moved. They were um. They were overcoming what I had felt was one of the most feared handicaps, blindness. Wouldn't it be terrible to be blind, I thought. My thought was quickly interrupted by horror when I saw that this couple was not walking in the crosswalk any longer, but were veering diagonally over into the middle of the intersection. Without realizing the danger they were in, they were walking right smack into the path of oncoming cars. I was frightened for them because I didn't know if the other drivers understood what was happening. As I watched, I saw a miracle unfold right before me. Every car in every direction came to a complete stop. No screech of brakes. No honking of horns, 
No one yelling out their windows, get out of the way. Everything froze, and time seemed to stand still for this family. I looked at the cars around me, and everyone was focused on the couple. Suddenly a driver stuck his head out of the car window and yelled, to your right, to your right. And then another driver did the same, and then another. All were helping them to, or direct, giving them directions to help this couple get back on the right path. Never skipping a beat, the couple adjusted their course and followed the coaching. Trusting their canes and the advice offered by motorists, they kept on walking and soon they had made their way to the other side of the intersection and continued walking down the sidewalk of the street, arm in arm. I believe that everyone who observed all that was deeply moved by what they saw. And what amazed me was, here were all of these motorists that paused, stepping outside of themselves for a moment to help four people in need. We continue our worship series on mountaintop experience based upon Jesus' Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 through 7. In the first week, in the first part of this sermon, Jesus begins by outlining for us eight characteristics, essential characteristics of a Christ follower. We know them as the Beatitudes, which is a Latin word meaning blessing, Blessed are you when. The second week we looked at the subject of the law. Jesus, came, Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And we looked at the very important place that the law has in our lives, pointing us to our sin and how Jesus, though he has, he has uh, fulfilled much of the law, the ceremonial laws are no longer needed because of have Jesus' death and resurrection. Much of the law, moral law particularly, are laws that God intends for us to follow as Christ's followers. Last week we looked at the subject of, of, uh, of, of, sac of the sacraments, of, of almsgiving, and of praying, and of fasting. And how these are part of the spiritual, some of the spiritual disciplines that God has made possible for us to use in order for us to experience a righteousness of being made right or being put in a right relationship with Him. Now today, Jesus directs his, this portion of the sermon toward the public business of the world. He answers questions about money and possessions, and He talks about ambition and, yes, about worry. Throughout the sermon, Jesus calls us to be different. One of the worst things that a Christian could hear said about them is, you are no different from anyone else. God calls us to be counter to counterculture living, different values, different lifestyles, different morals and values. Even if it seems like everyone else is doing it, that's no excuse for you if your goal is to follow God and live your life after Him. In this passage, we find Jesus talking about alternatives that we have. When you think about it, there are different alternatives that we have in life. In this particular passage, he talks about two locations for your treasure, in heaven or on earth, and two bodily conditions, light or darkness, two masters, God or wealth, and two preoccupations, our bodies or God's kingdom. The ultimatum that he gives is you can't sit on a fence. We have to make a choice. So the first choice that he gives us, the first alternative that we have to choose from, is where we place our treasure. Do not store up your treasure in heaven, on earth, he says, where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But rather store up your treasure in heaven where neither rust nor moth can destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love the bumper sticker that said, I'm laying up my treasures in heaven. Just look at my car. 
What did Jesus mean by storing up our treasures on earth? That's the selfish accumulation of things. It's the extravagant and luxurious extravagant and luxurious living for oneself without thinking of others. It's hard-heartedness that doesn't feel the need of the underprivileged. It's materialism that ties our hearts to earth. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount continuously refers to the heart. This time, he says that our hearts will follow the direction of our treasure, and that will either be up toward heaven or downward toward earth. Treasure in heaven is incorruptible, Jesus says. Treasure in heaven is to give something or to do something on earth whose effect will last for eternity. The giving to Christian causes is an investment whose dividends are everlasting. Giving to church, because the church belongs to God, the church is God's, is, tre is treasure in heaven. Treasure in heaven is secure, says Jesus. Treasure in heaven is both monetary giving as well as the giving of our time and our talent. The motorists that paused that day for the blind couple crossing the busy intersection were also giving something. They were giving of themselves. They certainly gave, up, gave, gave of their time, for they all stayed right where they were. They paused for a moment. And they gave of their concern. They gave encouragement. They gave empathy and, and compassion toward that couple. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, says Jesus. The second alternative that Jesus points to has to do with our eyes. The eye is the lamp of the body, he says. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If we had been there at that busy intersection the day that the blind couple were making their way across the street, what do you think you would have felt? You might have thought how fortunate you are to have your sight, right? And how courageous blind people are. You might have thought how strong they are to adapt all the rest of their senses to compensate for their handicap of blindness and how dark their world must be to not be able to see with their eyes. Jesus says that one's world really is dark who, whose eye is bad. So that begs the question, what is a bad eye? Another translation calls it an eye that is not sound. What does that mean to have an eye that is not sound? The eye is the window to the body, Jesus says. It's the lamp. In the Bible, the eye and the heart are often used interchangeably. In, one, in Psalm 119, the psalmist says, With my whole heart I seek, I seek thee, O Lord. Let me not wander from thy commandments. And just later, a couple of verses later, he says, I have fixed my eyes on all thy commandments. Jesus moves from the importance of having our hearts in the right place to the importance of having our eyes good or sound and healthy. Just as our eyes affects our whole body, so our ambitions and our attitudes, in other words, where we fix our eyes and fix our hearts, they have, that affects our whole lives. A mother said to her young son as they were leaving a store one day, Did you see that dirty look that man gave to me? To which her son replied, No, he didn't, Mom. You had that look when you came in here. A good eye. A line from Shakespeare in the first act of Julius Caesar says, Thy The fault, dear Brutus, is not in the stars, but in ourselves. This thing of the, of the eye really is a matter of vision. If we have physical vision, we can see where we're going. If we have spiritual vision, we have purpose and drive. 
But if the false gods of materialism cloud our vision and we lose the sense of right values, then our whole life is in darkness. And the result is we really don't know where we're going. The eye is the lamp of the body, Jesus said. The third alternative that Jesus gives us, or the third thing that he says in this portion of his sermon, has to do with uh, no one can, serving, can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters, he said, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one, to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth, Jesus said. Jesus does seem to give us lots of alternatives and choices, doesn't he? When you think about it, sheep or goats, figs or thistles, right or wrong, the world or the Father, the broad road or the narrow road, time or eternity. The alternatives have many names, but it always boils down to one immensely important decision. Choose this day whom you will serve. We are forever trying to have it both ways, but unfortunately it doesn't work that way, says Jesus. You can't travel in two different directions at the same time. Either you are for me or you are against me. Either you are with me or you are not. One is selfish, one who is selfish cannot at the same time be generous, and one who is mean cannot at the same time be kind. One thing that was probably very true about the blind couple crossing the busy intersection that day was their loyalty, their devotion, and their commitment to each other. For as they crossed the intersection, arrived at the curb on the other side, they continued walking down the street arm in arm. I could imagine that they had learned to trust each other and to trust the instructions of others who could see what they could not see. We have to make choices every day. We have to make choices that express to whom we have given our devotion God makes a simple demand. Our exclusive devotion to Him. No one can serve two masters, said Jesus. Well, finally, the last alternative that give, Jesus gives us in this portion of His sermon, the last thing that He says in this passage is, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? As the blind couple stood on the edge of, at the edge of the intersection, they had to have known from the sound of the cars passing by that that was a very busy intersection. There was an obstacle in front of them, eight lanes of traffic, all in a sense aimed directly at them. And yet, and yet in quiet trust and determination, they moved out. With their children in their arms or in their hands, they set out confidently. It's interesting that when the subject of worry and anxiety come up, Jesus tells us to consider the birds of all things. I always had a certain fascination with St. Francis of Assisi. For nearly all of our married lives, Joy and I have had a statue of St. Francis in our yard. We have one in our yard right now. Now, you may know some of the story of St. Francis, how he was born into a very wealthy merchant family, and how he chose to give up a life of ease and a life of wealth in order to serve God and to follow God as a monk. But the other thing St. Francis is known for is his love for the animals, and particularly his love for birds. 
on just about every statue of St. Francis, you'll find a bird perched on his shoulder. An interesting thing about God feeding and taking care of the birds is that they neither is that they still work for their food. Some are seed eaters, some are fish eaters, some are insectivores, some are predators, some are scavengers. God does not directly feed them, but he does so in providing for them in nature everything that they need to feed themselves. Perhaps Jesus' point here is summed up by this little poem. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think it must be that they have have no heavenly father that cares for you and me. The God who created us and gave us our lives is the God who has also given us everything that we need for life and the God who cares for us and the God who sustains us. And that can be a fact of our everyday experience of life. We need not worry or be anxious. Our God shall supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. And then Jesus concluded this portion of his sermon with that very memorable verse, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? And all these things, all these things shall be added unto you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me? O oh God, we do want to seek your kingdom and your righteousness above all else. We know that such a lifestyle starts with us and with every department of our lives, our homes, our marriages, our relationships, our families, our personal morality, our professional or work lives, our business ethics, our behavior at school, our bank books, our giving, our lifestyles. Teach us to joyfully and freely submit our whole lives to you. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We invite you to join in singing our closing hymn, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is.
Now receive God's blessing on your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.